Right. Well, what a um, certainly an inspiring overview of all of our services. Um, we've heard about the um, provincial and the structural level, and we're going to sort of come down one level to focus on now the individual health authorities. This is the second year that we've done this. I think it's so nice to hear from um, representatives of each health authority to hear about an innovative project that they're doing. Um, I will just say that we're running a little bit behind. These are 10-minute um, presentations from um, each health authority. And just for purposes of running on schedule, we're going to shorten the um, question and answer, um, perhaps just down to one question for each speaker. Please feel free to approach speakers after um, if you had further uh, information. But I think everybody appreciates if we keep running on time. So um, I'll, I'll first introduce then Dr. Cherry Mammon, um, who's going to be speaking to us with an update on the clinical pathways, uh, and that was introduced last year. Dr. Mammon. Thank you for the uh, introduction, and uh, good morning. Um, so from across town, there has been a number of us, including myself, that have been uh, prominently engaged and motivated uh, to develop and implement patient-engaged clinical pathways. And this was a topic that was uh, presented nicely by my colleague Janice Dion last year at the same event. And this presentation is a quick update on what we're doing. I think the first point I have to make uh, before I start is that a lot of people confuse the terminology of clinical pathways. They often confuse it with other terms like clinical practice guidelines or clinical protocols. It's important to remember that it's not the same thing. A clinical pathway is really a standardized guide that is used to plan, coordinate, deliver, monitor, and review care concurrently. And I think the important point is that we initially attempted to try to attack many conditions uh, in terms of our clinical pathway efforts, but we started with childhood nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is a chronic relapsing condition, mostly uh, diagnosed in young uh, children that's characterized by episodes of edema, heavy proteinuria, and low serum albumin levels. So we created this in September two thir 2013 and our efforts continue, and we continue to refine the process. Our nephrotic syndrome pathway is a patient-centered model of care that involves three major groups equally. One is the community physicians, pediatricians, and sometimes family doctors who have to take care of these children across the province at various time points of their illness. Us, the nephrologists and our allied health team, really whose role is to lead and facilitate our pathway efforts. And the third is the patients and the family and themselves. And from a patient perspective, it's important to mention that this pathway really is a map of their journey right at the time they're diagnosed and initially treated, all the way till years later where they have continual relapses and their ongoing surveillance. So why did we develop a nephrotic syndrome pathway? There are several reasons. The first is that this is a relatively common and relatively uncomplicated condition compared to some of our other diseases with 12 to 15 new patients diagnosed a year in our, in our province and greater than 100, 135 prevalent patients in our clinic system at BC Children's Hospital to the point where we have now with this pathway developed a dedicated nephrotic syndrome clinic. The second is geographical considerations. We are all centered, our pediatric nephrology team in Vancouver and our patients live all over this vast province. So that means pediatricians and sometimes family doctors have to face these complex patients and are responsible for their care at various time points. So that means we need to empower these physicians, educate them, and support them at treating these patients optimally. The third biggest driver is significant, what I like to call unnecessary local practice variation. It is amazing when we look back a decade what kind of different dosing regimens were used for prednisone for our patients from not just pediatricians but within our nephrology team, varying levels of investigations and diagnosis, various follow-up practice, and really inconsistent charting. We really knew that we could do better. Accompanying this pathway are three really important resources. One is a parent handbook that really covers every aspect of nephrotic syndrome you can think of, 
and is used as an educational guide for parents and families to feel more comfortable with the disease and the process. The second is handbook worksheets. This is a monitoring tool that patients use to track their disease progress. And the third is a physician's handbook for pediatricians and family doctors and even some of our nephrologists as well who know less about the disease. But this is basically an educational guide that mirrors the parent handbook but more in medical language all about the different aspects of the treatments and the disease. So the parent handbook covers all sorts of things like types of nephrotic syndrome how complications occur, like edema, prednisone, all about its course and side effects, how to dip urine uh, for protein with dipstick, which is really a key skill that parents have to pick up for ongoing monitoring, what to eat, and most importantly, what not to eat during diagnosis and relapses, immunizations, infections, as well as what to expect in terms of their follow-up moving forward. The patient home monitoring tool really is kind of a boring looking book with a lot of blank pages, but really it's key. This is where we tell patients and families to record their urine dipstick results in terms of the amount of protein, their medication doses, their daily weights, their fluid intake, and any kind of notes uh, detailing their process of care. This is the book that we tell patients to bring back to clinic, and it has been so useful at tracking their progress and getting them in, like really involved in their own care. From a physician standpoint, this is how the pathway looks. A patient enters with edema on the top left with diagnostic criteria and a set of baseline investigations. On the right there are uh, referral uh, reasons for to con contact nephrology right at the start, how to treat with steroids in terms of dose duration, when to refer after starting therapy, and very important definitions on the right, which are really always confused by pediatricians and are really important for prognostication, and on the left, ongoing surveillance. That's characterized by a surveillance checklist, which really tells the physician at different time points what to do in terms of history, physical investigations, and reminders of when to see a dietitian, when to do ophthalmology checks, et cetera, et cetera. So we started the pathway in 2013, in late 2013, and we were very proud of the implementation process, but we really needed to know what were the primary physicians and pediatricians thinking about this? Did they think it was necessary? Did they agree with it? So we did a survey in 2015 at a, at a BC Pediatric Society conference that we spoke at about this topic, and we were able to get 32 respondents. We asked several questions, and I'm gonna share with you some just interesting ones here. We asked the pediatricians, how many nephrotic syndrome patients did you encounter in the past year? Out of those 32 uh, respondents, 38% said only one to five nephrotic syndrome patients, while 62% said none. That means that this is a group of physicians that's probably not comfortable with the disease, even though they don't often say it, and often would need support and resources to optimally care for the patient. Then we asked them, who did they think was the most appropriate provider for an un uncomplicated case? The majority thought pediatricians alone could handle this disease with the proper resources, and 37.5% thought both. So I thought we felt we were justified, and I think pediatricians were on board with the process. So then over time, in our dedicated nephrotic syndrome clinic, we gave patients and their parents surveys to see how they were doing with this pathway and what they thought of it. These are just basically statements that they had to agree or disagree in a scale in terms of some of our resources and their opinions. The handbook is easy to understand. The worksheets are easy to use. Are you satisfied with clinical care? Are you well informed with the disease? You can see in the grand majority most agreed or strongly agreed, and I promise I didn't cherry pick the uh, positive answers from the list. I just wanted to share with you one of the biggest challenges of pathway development and implementation. You start something, and then it has to change. And this is an example how new medical evidence really forces you to change your pathway and shows you how a pathway is dynamic in nature and not static. I told you that prednisone is a mainstay of treatment and we had to standardize our approach. So when we started our pathway, we scoured the literature and found evidence that suggested that the longer you treat with prednisone and the higher doses you use for the first episode, you could improve upon relapsing outcomes in terms of number of relapses, frequency of relapses. So we followed that evidence and we picked a six month course of oral prednisone, which many centers in Canada do. And this is high and long and of course has its side effects, but we thought it would be good in the long run. So we implemented this. But then as we were doing this, of course, three 
really well done randomized controlled trials in pediatrics, one from the Netherlands, the second from India, and the third from Japan, all suggested that we don't need to use six month course of prednisone, you could get away with two or three months with the same relapsing outcomes. These were well done trials, our pathway team critically appraised the literature and felt we needed to change. And what did that mean? We needed to change all our booklets, change our knowledge translation efforts, and start from scratch, but that's okay. So with that in mind, our old dosing regimen of six months of prednisone came down to 12 weeks. So with that, patients are happy at least. We use almost 700 milligrams per meter squared, less of prednisone for patients, which really is a good thing in terms of their long-term corticosteroid burden. Last point I want to make is that it is really important that clinical pathways are viewed as a quality improvement tool that lends itself to audit. In the quality improvement world, there is a foundation called the PDSA cycle, and that stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act. And in this uh, image here, imagine an imaginary x-axis that's time and a y-axis that is improvement in quality of care. So as you go through your pathway from start to finish, you continually go through this PDSA cycle to try and improve the outcome and the quality of care. And that's exactly what we've done. And I think this is a good example of how new evidence has changed the process. 36 patients now have entered our pathway at Children's Hospital. A detailed audit is underway in terms of pathway compliance, how well patients did in terms of outcomes, and what were the holes in terms of improvement so we can move on. With that in mind, I'd like to acknowledge our clinical pathway team, which is a large team led by myself and Dr. Uh, Douglas Matzel, our division head, and a large group of uh, pediatricians at Children's Hospital, as well as our allied health team, which has been pivotal at uh, development and impl implementation. And I think hopefully we can share with you our adventures moving to the future with this condition and hopefully other conditions, including childhood hypertension, antenatally detected urinary tract anomalies, and several others. Thank you very much. Um, throughout, in a few locations throughout the room. That's a great question. So uh, we did definitely concentrate uh, on English as a start, but I think there's been much more in our survey. That was one of the comments. We have a lot of Punjabi patients and patients who speak Mandarin, so we're now moving towards uh, translating some of these uh, guides into other languages. Some of our fellows who have gone on to Saudi Arabia, I've just heard last week at a conference in Brazil, I've translated our books into Arabic, so it's nice to see some international use of our uh, resources. Cool. Uh, we're going to move on to Fraser Health Authority now, and we're going to hear from Dr. Robin Cho, um, who's going to speak about in-center nocturnal dialysis launch and a description of the patient experience data. Dr. Cho. Good morning. I'm here to speak today on behalf of myself, Dr. Gerardo Carpinito, our nocturnal hemodialysis physician lead, Dr. Daniel Schwartz, our medical director, and Wellman Lee, our program director, about our nocturnal program. As you may have heard over the years, our nocturnal in-center hemodialysis program has been a complement to the Fraser Health Renal Program. Um, other programs, including our in-center hemodialysis program, our CDU program, our home hemo program, our PD program over two sites, and our post-renal transplant program. The Fraser Health In-Center Nocturnal Hemodialysis Program was launched at Surrey Memorial Hospital in June 2013. We subsequently expanded the program to Royal Columbian Hospital in September 2014, and lastly to the Abbotsford Re Regional Hospital and Cancer Center in September 2015. There are now currently 50 spots in the Nocturnal Hemodialysis Program, with 30 being at SMH, 10 at RCH, and 10 at ARH. This is our standard dialysis prescription. We offer our patients three dialysis sessions on non-consecutive days a week with seven hours per session. Dialysis uh, parameters as you see there and uh, heparin and potassium algorithms as you can see as well. 
In terms of patient numbers, and these patient numbers are current as of February this year when we did our evaluation, at that point we had 26 patients on the program at Surrey Hospital, 7 at RCH, 10 at Abbotsford Hospital for a total patient count of 43 out of a possible total of 50. Altogether, when we look at the total number of patients who have ever been on our program, we've had 53 at SMH, 36 at RCH, and 12 at Abbotsford, making a total of 101 patients who have ever experienced nocturnal dialysis with Fraser Health. This graph here represents the patients in terms of the duration on the nocturnal program as of February 2016. Each dot represents one patient, and as you can see, at that point in time, we've had patients who have been on the nocturnal program anywhere from half a month of duration to 31 months of duration. The patients who have been with our program for 31 months at that point had been with our program since the very, very beginning of the nocturnal dialysis program at Fraser Health. In terms of the evaluation of this program, we looked at it on two levels. First, we did a quantitative evaluation looking at some of the clinical parameters. And secondly, we looked at a quality of level um, in terms of patient experience. For the quantitative analysis, we focused on a number of domains. We looked at electrolyte balance, dialysis adequacy, fluid and blood pressure control, anemia management, and mineral and bone disease. We looked at each of those, these parameters at the three, six, and 12 month marks post transition to nocturnal dialysis and compared these values with our patients pre nocturnal dialysis. Some of the results are presented here, and I'll just draw your attention to the points that we've highlighted in blue there. Of course, urea reduction ratio had gone up as one would expect. It seemed to be associated with better anemia management as well. We saw a reduction in phosphate levels, and in terms of phosphate binder, pill, phosphate binder pill burden, which is something quite meaningful to our patients, we saw a reduction in the necessities of phosphate binders. Moving on to our patient experience interviews. So we developed a semi-structured interview guide which we use for this component, and our inclusion criteria was anybody who had been on nocturnal dialysis for a minimum duration of three months and who were still currently on nocturnal dialysis at the time that we approached them. We had the intention of interviewing up to 20 participants or until data saturation were achieved. In terms of the interview timeline, we conducted interviews between the months of February and May of this year in a setting that was outside of the usual setting where our patients received their dialysis care. We identified 27 patients who were eligible for our interviews. 15 of these patients provided us with informed consent, and we went on to interview 12 out of these 15 patients during the timeline that we specified. Nine out of these patients were male, three of them were female. You can see here that the age range of these patients was quite variable, anywhere from 29 to 81 years of age, when their dialysis vintage is fairly variable as well, anywhere from one to 16 years of dialysis experience when they participated in our interviews. We focused on a number of discussion themes, and these, theme fo these themes focused on the elements of quality, safety, and communication. We asked them about life with dialysis in general, we asked them about the nocturnal hemodialysis experience with us, quality of life, perception of health, communication. We then closed off the interview by asking for any suggestions that they had for improvement and offering them the chance to bring up anything else that they wanted to talk about. In terms of life with dialysis, and this is life with dialysis in general, not specifically nocturnal dialysis, our patients expressed that life with dialysis had been positive overall and they had felt better since starting dialysis compared to their pre-dialysis days. They had better weight control. In their words, they had improved kidney function. They had better lab value control, and they had more energy and endurance. Two out of the 12 patients that we spoke to had not perceived changes in their overall health as a result of dialysis, and two other patients had reported weakness and dizziness since starting dialysis. In terms of the noct nocturnal patient experience, 10 out of our 12 patients expressed overall satisfaction with our program, with many of our patients describing nocturnal hemodialysis being the best dialysis experience that they've ever had so far. Two out of our 12 patients, however, did report that nocturnal dialysis had not been a positive experience for them for the following reasons. A perceived lack of medical attention, a lack of perceived benefits since the transition to nocturnal dialysis, and conflicts with the times and personal schedules. In terms of quality of life, our, our participants mentioned that their quality of life had been positive impactly since the transition, with the main benefit of nocturnal hemodialysis being having the whole day to do things or being able to do many things in one day. They were now able to do more physically demanding tasks, they were able to eat more freely, they were more feeling normal, and they were feeling younger. 
we had one participant who was in their ninth decade of life tell us that they were feeling 20 again. So if anybody else wants to sign up, <laughs> come see me. Two of our patients reported no change in quality of life. And in terms of some, ne some of the negative impacts, uh, we heard from some participants that it affected their ability to sleep in the, hosp uh, in the hospital. Uh, they were feeling tired the next day after receiving the nocturnal dialysis treatment. And perhaps they were feeling alone in the hospital without the presence of their family members. Perception of health. So it's been positive for most of our patients uh, with a general sense of health improvement and well-being since transitioning over to nocturnal hemodialysis. There were some patients who reported no change in their health, as I mentioned earlier, and two of our patients did report feeling worse compared to conventional hemodialysis. In terms of communication, 11 out of our 12 participants mentioned that they felt that it was important to be in touch with the healthcare team as part of their care. Uh, one of the downfalls that they mentioned was that it was not possible to talk to a physician, a pharmacist, or a dietitian during their nocturnal dialysis shift. In-person communication with the RNs who were working the night shift was the main avenue of interaction for our patients with the healthcare team. And we asked specifically the question about whether our patients receive conflicting information from different individuals about nocturnal dialysis. And none of our patients reported doing so, and this was in the context of either the benefits of nocturnal dialysis or information about the nocturnal dialysis program in general. Like I said, we, met, we asked our participants for their suggestions for improvement for our program. Having physicians at night, <laughs> which, you know, as, as we can see, as we can all uh, see here, may be uh, somewhat challenging. There is an on-call physician that we have at night um, for our program. Uh, extended the program to more, more participants. So by this, they meant having more spots in the program so that more patients could benefit from this modality. Extending the treatment hours or allowing the patients to stay longer in their dialysis beds. So extending the treatment duration per session. Giving patients a day off every once in a while to be with family. Having private rooms for each patient was something that we heard from our patients would be, which would enhance their experience. Implementing stricter, stricter requirements to be admitted into the nocturnal program so that minimi it minimizes disruption to the current patients in the program. Improving or coordinating with the handy dart service schedule so that our patients are not waiting hours after their shift to go home. And having more nurses on the night shift, we're currently using a, a five to one patient to RN ratio with our nocturnal dialysis compared to a three to one or four to one in center or CDU ratio. In summary, we have had a, we've had a very successful nocturnal hemodialysis program launch at Fraser Health. Our quantitative evaluation suggests that nocturnal hemodialysis at Fraser Health has been equivalent or better than conventional hemodialysis in the studied outcomes. It's been perceived positively by our patients. Our patients have favored, in general, nocturnal hemodialysis over conventional hemodialysis, with their main benefit being on their quality of life. The absence of physici physicians at night seems to be one of the main downfalls for our participants. Um, however, they do realize that they're able to access a physician uh, if they need to during the daytime, or if something emergent comes up overnight, the physician can be called. And one last point that we heard from our patients was that spending nights at the hospital can be challenging, can be difficult for our patients. So having that support network for them, especially at the very beginning stages, uh, whether it's family, friends, or healthcare providers, was fairly important for them. The other thing that we heard from them was to give nocturnal dialysis a chance. Don't give up in your first two to three weeks. It may take a little bit of time to transition over and get adjusted to the new environment. Give it some time before you decide whether it's really right or not right for you. With that, I'd like to send off a few acknowledgements to people who have made this implementation and the evaluation possible. Dr. Preeti Flanagan was my co-investigator of the patient experience component. Adriana was our specialist in patient experience interviews from UBC. Our clinical pharmacy technician, Serena Gyo, um, she was also our data assistant. Elaine was our project lead for nocturnal dialysis implementation. Nocturnal dialysis steering committee members, as you see there. I'd like to acknowledge the Fraser Health Renal Program frontline staff, and these are the frontline staff that work so hard on a day-to-day -day basis to make this program possible. So all the RNs, the CNEs, the transition nurses, all the allied healthcare providers, and everybody else who's played a part in this. And lastly, for the BC Renal Agency for your support. Thank you. Did you feel like they had representative feelings for what you told them that they should 
That's a great question. So we didn't actually uh, formally get feedback from the patients who did not cons consent for the interviews uh, in terms of evaluating our program. However, we do talk to these patients, of course, on a regular basis as part of our continuing care and quality improvement of our program. So uh, the, the feedback was encompassed that way for those patients. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Interior Health Authority. Um, I'd like to um, welcome Marg Dom, the renal manager, um, who's going to speak about pre and post transplant redesign. Marg? I apologize for not knowing everything about transplant. It's one of the few areas of um, Reno that I never did work at prior to being a manager. It's a, this program was put together by Kim McDuff, who is a transplant coordinator network position in Interior Health. So what we've done is we've looked at our challenges with transplant and created a few different things that to move forward with. Okay. So. Um, Basically, the, the project goal was to try and um, take a look at what all the programs within Interior Health were doing and then move forward to kind of regionalize what everybody does, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, we were able to take a look at all of the programs within our region as well as looking at um, St. Paul's and VGH and how we could increase the communications across the board and kind of standardize the transplant delivery pre and post because we know that's where the numbers are improving, are increasing quite significantly. Um, and to give pre-transplant education to the patients um, so that they can make that decision preemptively as well as while on dialysis. So pre-transplant, what we have done is we've, this is the uh, West Kootenai pre-transplant pathways because what we did identify within the regions is everybody's taking a little bit of a piece of what, pre, what is done for tree plants, transplant workup. And um, this is the pathway that we have for the West Kootenays. Um, Kelowna has a different one, TCS has a different one. So we just did it individually, what we are presently doing and put it into a map. And if you notice, the last three at the bottom is what our transplant nurse does after all of the information is put forward. Uh, we've also developed a pre-transplant referral um, checklist and orders so that um, the complicating thing for pre-transplant is the smaller centers, say like um, Cranbrook and stuff, that they don't really know what the lab tests are. We get these big orders and stuff, of what tubes we have to draw the blood, that kind of thing. So we standardized that. It's um, still in draft and working with uh, VGH and St. Paul's with that. Um, the role of the social worker as well is identified. Um, they have a big part of it and we need to kind of solidify that. Um, we also needed to take that program with the social workers involved and how do we orientate new social workers to the program. Um, Post-transplant, we've done a lot of work. We did a standardized lab um, requisition and it was in collaboration with a, a number of other areas. Um, provincially, the lab um, we pulled in from different parts of the interior. Uh, it seems to be going well. It's very similar to the CKD uh, lab requisition in that there's one requisition and it covers over the full year. Uh, we also standardize a letter to the family physicians that is sent to them once their patients are coming back to their home communities from Vancouver. So basically the GPs know what's going on, what their expectations are for that as well. Um, we did a interior health uh, transplant project and there was a poster on it last year at BC Kidney Days. And this is the big thing that um, was challenging in the Kootenays is because we have patients in Trail, but we also have patients in Invermere. We don't have anybody in Golden, but we have Sparwood. And when you take a look at the geography and travel that's involved to get these people to a transplant clinic, 
it's significant financial and safety hazards, especially through the winter. So we started in 2014 when I started there, and um, we did our first one in December of um, 2014. Patients loved it. In, we had to make it, we did it as a project, but we had to make it sustainable. One of the um, things that BCT wanted was to have a face-to-face -face meeting. So what we have done is the visits that are required through the winter um, are done through telehealth in Invermere and Cranbrook at this point in time. We started with Cranbrook, expanded this past year into Invermere. Uh, we will go to Golden if we have any transplant patients there as well. And then through the months that it's more convenient and less uh, hazardous to travel through the mountain passes, that's when they do their face-to-face. -face. So May to September, and then now we're transitioning back into doing telehealth. Uh, we utilized a lot of our resources with transplant. Um, for telehealth, it's been a bit of a challenge because the space continuum that happens as well. Um, because if you've ever been to KBRH, the first thing you know is there is no space. So double bookings and different things. So we've had to, a few challenges there. Um, the community pharmacist is the other project that uh, Interior Health has been using. And what they've done is they're working with Lakeside Pharmacy in Kelowna. And the pharmacists actually come to the transplant um, visits for the patients. And it's been very popularly received by both the transplant nurses as well as the transplant um, patients. They learned a lot. Um, the nurses learned a lot. But one of the things that was identified um, was that that pharmacist needs to be a specific have a special interest. There needs to be further training for the pharmacist so that they know how the clinic and the physicians and the medications kind of um, affect. So it's not every um, pharmacist can be a, at the clinic. Um, they also found that the project was not financially sustainable for the contract pharmacies. So they're looking at that. Things are being put on hold, as you know, with um, the contracts going out for the Carino pharmacies, and they're also looking at what we can do for our transplant pharmacies as well. Um, there's our patient survey, basically. Um, they were very positive that it, it now was a total multidisciplinary team that they were dealing with when they came for their transplant appointments. Um, like I said, the nurses thought it was wonderful as well. They learned a lot. Uh, so the project ended in September of this year, just a few days ago. Um, what we learned is that we need a high level of engagement and support and the communication that has to happen with both of the projects is big because we were found that people were doing different things and working in silos. So what these two projects did is they brought our team together to baby, basically have a cohesive positive um, output for our patients. Um, we did need the buy-in from all the team. Everybody was excited about doing these projects. So that was really advantageous to it, um, to support the patients. Um, the evaluation for these projects are being written up right now. So I don't have anything to support that. The, the next steps is we need continued um, communication with St. Paul's and VGH. Uh, social workers meet on a regular basis. Um, and I think it's monthly they meet, I'm not sure. But it's, it's really helped to bring the team together and take th some of the mystique out of transplant. Um, and that's all I can offer you. If you have any questions, Kim McDuff, and that's her email, could probably answer it better than I could. But if there's any baseline questions, I'll try. Okay, the next uh, we'll be hearing from Northern Health Authority, and I'll just remind everybody that they do have a live poll question for this, so if you can just have your app handy. Um, we're going to hear from Sherry Yeast, Renal Manager, and from uh, Dr. Anurag Singh, and they're going to give us an update on telekidney care in Northern BC. So good morning, everyone. 
So we're going to talk about the Tele-Kidney Care Project in Northern Health. You've already heard that they are mentioning that. So the theme of this project really is, is access to care. And you can imagine it's a big concern for the wide geography we live in. So our project really is dedicated to people who live in rural, remote, beautiful BC and, and, and suffer and manage chronic disease and chronic kidney disease especially. So, so the first slide, what is telekidney care? It's a word that obviously we've come up with. It's, it's really a, a means to deliver the care, and I really mean optimal care that patients who should have received in the first place. And we're not developing a new clinic, we're not developing a separate stream of care, we're just doing using video conferencing in our normal clinics, and I mean kidney clinics, transplant clinics, PD clinics, every form of ambulatory clinics to use this as a bridge to connect with our patients. And it's important to say that this is not the only means. So once people do video conferencing, that is not all. We, we, we bridge it as it suits the patients. And we hope eventually we will get to people's homes using the electronic gadgets they can connect with us from home. And it's a one-to-one -one encounter exactly on the same format we have in, the, in our multidisciplinary clinics. So even the transplant, CKD clinics, face-to-one-to-one -face -to -one encounter using our new technology that we have available. Okay. So these are some of the identified needs um, from at the beginning of the project that were brought about, and um, they're still at the forefront now. Um, there's still things that we're looking at. Keep going. Um, we're keeping these in mind as we go along um, to make sure that we're addressing these. The Teddy Kidney Care Project is really a collaboration. <coughs> Money is always an issue, so we realized that funding was an issue, so we actually wanted to build that. We've been trying to build video conferencing in our program for a long time. So we've applied for um, a grant, which was administered by the Specialist Services Committee, but supported by the Ministry of Health. So we got quite a substantial amount of money to, to build this within our program. And it's, it's year one, uh, just recently, so we'll be presenting an update for the first year. It's a pilot project over three years, and our idea is that we don't stop the project. The idea is we do this. This is the new normal from now onwards, and we can sustain it for an ongoing basis. So it's helped us to fund a project manager who's really helped to build connections, which are very important, collaborations to do, and get the whole team on board to do video conference. It's a very different way of doing things from even what we were doing before. And of course, we have the ability to have and hire two um, nurse consultants who are, you know, partly kidney care RNs, but also um, uh, building relationships and partnerships with our referral base, as in family doctors, education, and collaborating with the First Nations Health Authority, very importantly, and, and with other, um, uh, other partners in the communities. So um, some of the progress in the first year of the project um, and some of the things that we've been working on is um, working with our primary care homes throughout Northern Health and our First Nations Health Authority to provide education on kidney disease, what our programs have to offer, and the online referral system. Um, we'll continue working um, with these communities and more throughout Northern Health as our project progresses. The patient experience, <coughs> excuse me, we completed a baseline patient survey which showed us that um, overall experience of the patients were very positive and we'll continue to do these surveys throughout the um, length of the project. We're also working with Patient Voice Network to include them into our team and program moving forward. Um, in our team meetings, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Um, we completed process mapping both with the current clinic model and the future state moving forward with telehealth and this will continue as we progress. We've also developed a provider survey to get input from the team on what they felt was most important as we move forward. We've been working the last six months with the PROMISE team to help us develop um, a good reporting tool for patient outcomes that will show pertinent trends. And we're also working on developing a reporting system that will show our patient experience outcomes. And that, that promise piece is very important and would help us to evaluate our project and how we do going in the future. Okay. 
<clears throat> this was just a word cloud that was developed from our um, provider survey and it just shows that the main um, themes that were, um, our team wanted to focus on was that of patient care, communication and the team. So this is uh, uh, just like a run of our new referrals to a CKD clinic. One of the historical <laughs> issues we've had is people are referred too late to the nephrologist in the community, particularly patients who live in rural communities. And our, our um, mean or average CKD in the clinic has been very, um, GFR has been very low. So we are seeing a trend with increase, making it easy to refer to a nephrologist and to the CKD clinic and bridging with tele, uh, telehealth. Uh, our referrals are going up, uh, particularly the new referrals in our clinic. And also overall our CKD population, uh, which had been static for a number of years, is going up. So we are looking after many more patients in our clinics, particularly CKD clinic, than we did ever before. And that's as a result of the communication streamlining of the <coughs> overall clinic we've done um, uh, as a part of this project. So our main team is based out of Prince George. We started the first year focusing on the Northwest Health Service Delivery Area as we had a nurse already in the, um, there to help with the process. The main goal was to learn from this and then to be able to progress to the other communities. What we're finding is um, patients are hearing about the telehealth and more and more they want it sooner rather than later in all of their communities. So aligning aims to actions, this is an idea that what we thought we were going to do, uh, how are we doing? Um, so one of the main aims was more choice and better access. So choice to the patient, we still have folks who live in rural places but want to travel to Prince George for whatever reason, they have family, and that's a choice. They can choose to have a video con a virtual appointment or face to face. So, so we're offering that choice to most of our patients. And just to give you an idea, we're doing like something like 150 telehealth encounters a month now, including nephrologist's office. So my office could be typically built with 10 patients uh, seen in the morning. Five of them could be on video conferencing as they're scheduled face-to-face um, um, -face -face appointments. So, so it's, it's becoming a part of the routine. So we, are, we were offering more options in the Northwest, as Sherry said, but now, from now onwards, we're gonna roll it out to every other small community, as you saw on that map, um, going into the second year. So the second uh, aim was standardization of telehealth care. And that was a big deal, what it means. I mean, we did that before, and we didn't want to build a separate clinic doing it in a different way, because then we wouldn't be able to evaluate our outcomes. So we're doing exactly the same format um, encounter <coughs> that we do face-to-face, -face, and also learning from the team uh, how we improve that process going forward, but also making it easy for the primary care providers that the first encounter with the nephrologist is also virtual and is available on telehealth. So we built a referral form, a decision tool matrix for the family doctors that is available on the EMR for them to know who to refer. And, and the bigger piece, which we've learned is very, very important, is the community engagement piece and to develop partnerships. So one of our primary care nurses role that we got funded from this position was to partly do patient care. And we've realized how important it is for her to travel to smaller communities, talk about best practices, develop relationships, and, and, and learn from there. And also we're learning how important it is within our team to understand how well we're doing and reanalyzing. It's a dynamic process, so we're changing as we move along in this project. Other important pieces, now we are involving patients. So we have uh, two patients who will be joining our steering committee to give a voice to the patient to make this even better for and make it more patient-centric. So that's uh, another um, new initiative. So uh, I think I've talked about the last one, better experience for patients. So we're looking at uh, what Adira talked about, the PREMS, patient experience outcomes. That's how our surveys are tailored. We're using PDSA cycle to improve as we go along, but also involving patients that do better care for them in the kidney clinic format. So what we've learned in our first year um, is that Team engagement and communication is absolutely crucial, but not only with our own um, internal kidney care team, um, but also with the Northern Health Primary Care Homes and other stakeholders. <clears throat> One of our big challenges, <coughs> excuse me, moving to other communities, was that there wasn't always somebody on the other end um, to help the patients navigate where they're supposed to go, um, to make sure the video conferencing equipment was working at that site. Um, 
and um, one of our big concerns was that the patient would just be kind of lost and, and not have a really good experience with this. Um, Northern Health has developed a five-year telehealth plan which will align with our project in focusing on increasing telehealth quality and reliability in connecting with all the communities. Um, it's a long-term goal, so in the short term what we're doing is um, trying to visit as many communities as we, poss as we possibly can as a patient to um, navigate through, um, you had your telehealth appointment, now where do I go, is the video conferencing equipment working, do I need to do anything, and then that way it just gives us a little bit more information that we can pass on to our patients. <clears throat> our original vision, <coughs> excuse me, of the project was having <coughs> a nurse in the northwest and then later in the nor northeast to be with the patient for their clinic visit. Again, it was felt at the beginning it would be um, just a better overall patient experience if we could do this, but it soon became apparent that we had to start offering these telehealth clinics visits in all the communities, and so it's really not feasible to have a nurse in every community. Um, with that, the role of the clinical practice consultant has changed a bit, like Dr. Singh has said. Um, so our um, clinical practice consultant in the Northwest will be focusing more on education and support for the primary care homes and other stakeholders. The last thing is that um, we need to keep an open mind as we move forward and realize that what works in one community may not work in another, and what works for one patient may not work for all. So our main goal is to provide options to patients and their families that can ensure they receive optimal care without the inconvenience and cost of travel. So the polling question number one, um, there is no right or wrong answer, so we're just trying to understand what you guys think. So from your perspective, what do you think is the role of using virtual appointments? I mean, video conferencing appointments in kidney care. Is it a better patient experience? Do you think it's equitable <coughs> access to specialist team-based care? A sustainable model of care because of the economics and cost savings to remote people traveling from remote communities or all of the above? We felt this was the right answer yeah. too. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's still coming. Right, should we move to the next question? Okay. Oh. I think we had one more question, didn't we? Oh, it's still going. Oh, sorry. <coughs> there. Oh, no. Nope. Oh, okay. There we go. So the second question. <coughs> which is an interesting one, we've learned this, and again, we don't have a right and wrong answer, but what do you think are the risks of providing virtual kidney care? Uh, so doing this video conference thing, we think it's a great thing, patients love it. Um, is it suboptimal patient engagement and education because you can't connect with them face to face? Is it suboptimal patient outcomes? I'm, I'm not sure we know that, but d do you feel it's suboptimal provider experience or there are concerns about lack of confidentiality. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. No. Totally. 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 <laughs> yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. What Very we've sick. actually found is um, the patients love it. And we've actually had patients who we've had glitches in the system where they're either looking at a blank screen, they can hear us, but they can't see us, or the other way around. And even with following up on those patients, they still love the experience of being able to stay in their home community and have their visit um, remotely. Um, so our experience is it's mostly the provider experience that you know we're just not sure of, you know, are we providing the best care possible. And that's one of the things we, we will look at, but it's, we have <coughs> more concerns than our patients do for providing this kind of care. There is a demand, they want this to happen. But it's very interesting, we're obviously learning, as I said, we don't have outcomes from patients or providers going down over years. Hopefully we will in the next couple of years. But it's very interesting to learn that as a provider, it's harder for us to do this than it's, it is for them to have it. Thank you.
that's another one of those nice examples of the renal community being leaders. I think the specialist community and other care providers in Northern Health are going to benefit from the strategies they're implementing there. Uh, we'll move on next to um, Providence Health and Vancouver Coastal Health um, with an update on care models for the mega units. Um, this is an update from the introduction they'd provided last year. Um, we're going to hear from Dr. Mike Copeland and from Warren Hart, Administrative Program Director at Providence. Thank you. Um, so Mike and I are tag teaming today, so I'm going to talk about uh, the St. Paul's uh, in-center unit. Uh, last year, we presented a, a uh, an update on some fairly significant staff staffing model changes. So this year, uh, we thought we would just uh, share some of the smaller but still fairly important initiatives that are also going on on the on the in-center unit. Um, so I took uh, paperless to heart. So I just have one slide. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're just going to have to listen to me ramble and look around the room. But um, so the the. The first, the first initiative we have has been going on about a year or so. Um, it's a group of patients that have gotten together. Uh, they call themselves the Renal Task Force. Uh, they insist they're not a patient advisory committee. Um, so it's a group of patients who are really um, sort of uh, a group of patients for patients. They're a fairly organic group at the moment. Um, and uh, seem to be more, uh, more focused on kind of socialization activities, peer support, things like that. We do have one of our social workers that goes to their, goes to their meetings to provide some logistical support. And if there is stuff the group wants to come back to the unit leadership, then the, that social worker will bring that information back. Um, so uh, it's interesting. I personally think over time they're probably going to formalize into a patient advisory group of some sort. But for the moment, they're telling us to stay away and let them do their own thing. So we'll, <laughs> time will tell. I'll, be, I'll tell you next year how this turns out. Um, we also have a group that's doing a, a review of the role of the renal tech in, in the in-center unit. Um, and this group is made up of, obviously, unit leadership, some nurses, some techs. Uh, professional practice and um, a quality improvement support person. Uh, they're about part part way through their work, so we don't have any um, sort of any conclusions yet, or nothing nothing to trial. Uh, they are doing some time and motion studies, and the goal of this group is sort of twofold. One is to um, see if there's some value add that role can bring to the unit, and also to see if we can uh, improve some staff satisfaction in that in that group of staff. Um, the art cart program. Uh, for those of you that watch Global News, this actually made the news a couple weeks ago. Uh, and it's a, it's a program where we have uh, an artist who, who um, comes in and works with those patients that are interested while they're dialyzing on arts and crafts. Um, the, the, um, the pilot has just ended and uh, we're doing an evaluation that's in draft. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the draft or early, the kind of early part of the evaluation shows that uh, the patients liked it, the ones that participated. They found um, the distraction while they were dialyzing was, was positive. They also um, found that they were socializing with, with each other more while they were doing their crafts. And so they, um, on the, the downside, sustainability is going to be a bit of an issue, both from uh, getting artists to come on a consistent basis as, as, as well as um, money for all the supplies and things. So uh, once the evaluation is formalized, we'll, we'll uh, sit down and see what we're going to do with it. And then uh, finally, uh, the, the buddy system is, um, uh, I think, a number, a number of programs in hospitals have buddy systems where you take experienced patients and buddy them with p patients that are, that are new, in this case, new to the in-center, just to provide support, answer questions, do things, um, uh, just and generally uh, help them get through the, the early days of being a, a new patient. Um, we've just finished uh, a, a training program for our first few buddies and are about to start pairing them up. 
Um, it's a couple key things in the training that we learned from a couple other programs uh, at St. Paul's that have buddy programs is, um, you know, there's a big focus on patient confidentiality with the, with the buddies and also a fair bit of discussion on where the line is between providing support, answering questions, but not venturing into clinical advice. And so we spend a lot of time teaching the buddies where, where that line is bef so, um, as they go forward. So that program, as I said, is just about to start and obviously there'll be a, an evaluation at the end of the pilot. So um, over to you, Mike. Thanks, Warren. Um, so I'll move on and uh, speak a little bit about some of the things that have been happening. I, I'm not sure what I think about the term mega unit, um, but uh, uh, when I'm rounding in the dialysis unit, it does feel that way sometimes. Um, and I'll just talk about some of the initiatives that we've uh, started to undertake uh, in uh, Vancouver General. Um, and I've listed them here, and I'll, I'll, I do have a couple of slides on each of them uh, to talk about some transition rounds, which is very apropos for the theme of, uh, of the, the conference this year. Um, as well as an update about our staffing uh, care uh, model redesign, um, some inpatient training, or some training for inpatient provision of PD in the, in the program, which I know is not new in other programs, but I'll talk about some of the unique challenges at uh, a hospital like VGH for this. And then an update about the dialysis unit renovations. Um, so the transition rounds actually is something that grew out of uh, a Vancouver Coastal Providence Health. Um, uh, we've started an initiative once a year where we come together for a quality assurance day, a quality improvement day, uh, and really share ideas that uh, are, are happening in one hospital versus the other hospital. Um, and uh, the Vancouver group adopted this really uh, from uh, our colleagues over at St. Paul's. Uh, who've been doing this for some time, where we now on a monthly basis staff from the pre-dialysis uh, uh, transplant program, um, as well as the kidney care, care staff. And um, uh, prior to these meetings, we generate a, a quote-unquote low GFR list uh, uh, by a nephrologist and, and come together and spend an hour really to look at the patients that are reaching points of transitions and, uh, and to try to highlight um, uh, issues uh, to try to try to smooth out those transitions as much as we can and to, and, and to identify challenges, for instance, moving from CKD to dialysis so that the dialysis unit is aware of issues. Um, and I think really where we've uh, seen an enormous benefit um, from this is that it's really facilitated the discussions with our uh, transplant colleagues uh, for patients who are uh, getting closer uh, to, uh, to the point of needing um, uh, transplantation. And to, to Dr. Landsberg's point, um, what we what certainly grabbed our attention with this uh, from the St. Paul's program was the early impact it was having on their preemptive uh, transplant rates, uh, and that being a, a, a major goal for us um, to try to facilitate those conversations uh, uh, to try to maximize the chance of preemptive transplantation. So we started this uh, at VGH uh, in uh, the spring. Um, and so we've had about three or four of these meetings. It's still a, a work in evolution and a work in progress, but I think the feedback uh, that we're, we're certainly seeing and hearing is quite positive with this. And certainly the, the degree of communication, um, which is always a challenge in big programs, uh, does seem to be improving. Um, so um, that's certainly something that I think we're, uh, we're proud of the work we're starting with there. And again, just really acknowledge that uh, it's always a good idea to pilfer from, from your colleagues who've got something that's working and try to modify it for what's needed in your, uh, in your program. Um, just an update on the staffing model redesign. I think this was talked about last year um, where uh, we're starting to move not really into a primary uh, uh, nurse care uh, model, but more into uh, pods of uh, patients where patients are looked after by a, a, a consistent group of nurses in the dialysis program. We initially had started this with uh, a number of small, uh, smaller pods, sort of uh, six, uh, six station pods. Um, one lesson learned uh, is don't try to do this while you're also doing a major renovation. Um, <laughs> it created some real challenges, and in fact, f f because of some of those challenges, we've, we've really had to modify it at this point into sort of two larger teams. 
Um, uh, it's still definitely a work in progress, and I think probably this time next year we'll actually be able to uh, report out a little bit more, but some very preliminary high-level um, reporting is that uh, certainly from some of the patient satisfaction points of view, they're, they're, um, they're appreciating this change, and they, I think they do have a sense that people know their, their needs a little bit more rather than uh, a different individual each time for their treatment. Um, and uh, amongst the allied health and the physicians uh, that are regularly in the dialysis unit, um, there, there does seem to be a, a, a smoother transition to, to a resolution of issues that are arising because there's sort of somebody uh, who is able to, to, uh, to use the Canadian term, stick handle it through uh, uh, to, to solve it. This is maybe something that seems very strange, um, but in a hospital like Vancouver General, uh, it's actually, we don't have a, a dedicated renal ward. Our patients are distributed throughout a, about an 800 bed facility. Um, and so it's always been a major challenge when a PD patient, either from our program or from another program, comes in to be able to provide um, the PD. And we've had to be doing it where our PD staff go out to the wards to be providing the care. We've had a number of, uh, of uh, trials to try to uh, train up staff on the wards to be able to provide PD and through the emergency room. But the good news, bad news, is that um, obviously with the a low number of admission rates for peritoneal dialysis, and then when you try to distribute that over an 800-bed hospital, skill sets were just not uh, being maintained, and so that's never really gained traction. So we're trying a slightly different approach now. Uh, uh, this is in process where we've actually taken uh, one of the uh, acute medicine wards, T11, in the tower, um, and we're really focusing the training efforts there. Um, it's not a renal ward, but what we will end up trying to do is to cohort uh, appropriate and what I mean by that is if they're in with a hip fracture or something like that, that's not the person we're going to necessarily bring there. But if they're in for medical reasons in particular, we'll try to bring those patients uh, uh, to T11 and, uh, and uh, be able to have the team maintain their skills. And then finally, um, just in the last minute or two, um, I do want to... Uh, 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 mention a little bit about our uh, renovation, and really it's not a renovation, but a redesign of our dialysis unit. I mean, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge um, the support that actually came uh, across the province to allow this change to happen. Um, a couple of years ago when we were starting this uh, process, VGH was in uh, dire straits, I would really say. We were running uh, approximately 110% capacity in our dialysis units. Um, we were... Uh, we were, and unfortunately still are, um, because we're in the process of renovation, running between 10 and 15 patients off ward per day um, uh, to be able to provide dialysis. Um, and for patients that were starting dialysis, we were often having to keep them admitted in the hospital because there was no dialysis uh, outpatient availability. We were really struggling with, uh, with uh, the growth. And, and VGH and St. Paul's, I think, do have some unique challenges in that we have to serve our local population. But at the same time, we, uh, we, we, we see your patients all the time as well because they're coming down for specialized services at the hospital and we need to accommodate those people. So uh, about three years ago, through the facilities planning group, um, there was a, a very uh, large financial support from all health authorities to help VGH uh, through this trouble. And with some matching dollars through uh, donors, um, we're about two thirds of the way through our expansion right now. Um, so there is light at the end of the tunnel. I mentioned it's not just an expansion and a, and a renovation, it's actually a redesign. Um, uh, David's been here for 30 years, I've been here for 16 years now. Um, uh, and during that time, um, the independent dialysis program at Vancouver General, uh, both PD and Home Hemo, has moved at least three times before this renovation. And it was always a move into a non-dedicated area, it was a retrofit, it never really quite worked. But at the same time, independent therapies, PD and Home Hemo, um, particularly since 2004 for the Home Hemo, have been a huge uh, focus for us. And what this, what this uh, uh, program has now allowed us to do is to actually, for the first time ever, build a purpose-built uh, independent area. Um, and I'll share just one picture um, because it is quite a lovely space uh, that we now have and the patient feedback is, is really positive. This is, we actually have a deck. We, we don't have a barbecue on it yet, unfortunately, but uh, we do have a deck. Um, but you can see that it's a lovely area um, uh, for the patients and for the patients who are coming in for their home training and spending, you know, eight hours a day with us, it's actually quite nice for them to be able to have some 
uh, some natural light. So um, it's very exciting. It's, uh, it's really the, the patients uh, that do come over there, it, it's sort of a, a grabber to be able to keep them uh, for the independent therapies. Um, so, you know, we should be finished this in the next year or so, and, uh, and it's, uh, uh, been a, it's, it's going to be a huge benefit, certainly locally for us at VGH uh, and in Vancouver Coastal, um, but again, also really uh, as a provincial resource so that we can help to serve other patients. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Just in the interest of time, we'll move on. Um, we were scheduled for our break a few moments ago, but we still have to hear from uh, Island Health, and there's such important stuff to hear from Island Health. So thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. Um, there are refreshments after this, um, and uh, I think because you'll probably be keen to go after this, I won't come back to the podium. So if, just a reminder, if we can come back from the break then, we'll make it at 10.40 instead of the 10.30 as originally planned. So I'll introduce my colleagues. Amy and uh, Dr. Rachel Carson, and they're going to speak about um, something really interesting, the e-health uh, update. Uh, this has been a big event at Island Health. They'll tell you all about it. Um, and there's also a couple of live polling questions here as well, so just to have your app handy. So um, my name's Amy Hunter. This is Dr. Rachel Carson. And... Um, I just wanted to start with a disclaimer today to say that I'm not a promoter, nor a, um, am I paid for by any particular electronic health record company. And, <laughs> and uh, I am an employee of the Clinical Informatics Department of Island Health now. Uh, so who am I? Um, my job title officially is a medical informaticist, which is a little bit of a mouthful for most people, and most people are confused of what that even is. I describe myself as half computer and half nurse. So <laughs> what that means is I act as a translator between physician and clinician workflow into the electronic world. So using your BCKD uh, live poll, uh, do you know if your organization is planning to move or expand your EHR? I'm glad I asked that. So EHR is an electronic health record. Just so you know, anything that you look up for your patient. I know that number is going to go down now. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. And um, can we go to the next one? Or do I hit it? And for those of you who answered yes, do you think you're personally ready for this change? And do you think that your program is ready? I keep these questions as mi in mind as we go through this presentation. I see a smiling face from my health authority right now. I wonder what she's going to answer. <laughs> Did we do both? Okay. I uh, program. <laughs> Okay. So I don't have a post-live poll, but just keep those, those questions in mind as you go. All right. So I'd like to start with the elephant in the room. Some of you may have heard about the uh, rollout of the electronic health record at Island Health, otherwise known as iHealth. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm not here to talk about the merits of rolling out an electronic health record, nor am I here to talk about the specific experiences of some of the groups, but I do want to acknowledge that it has been a tough transition for many of our users. It's been a real, a real transition for many people. Um, so the primary role of the health record was done at NRGH, which is the um, regional tertiary center for center in North Vancouver Island. Um, we do have inpatient renal services there. And this is just a graphic to um, may or may not have been in of interest to you, but just to demonstrate the level of functionality that our EHR had before we went live in March 19th and where we are still sort of striving towards um, 
post March 19th for our site at NRGH. So it has been a huge change and therefore a lot of growing pains. So the theme of BCKD is the patient journey and transition. So this is just a quick slide to remind you that complex renal patients don't follow a traditional pathway generally. They can encounter any area of the hospital and um, they don't, they're predictably unpredictable. And this doesn't end as they are striving to get home to their multi-million dollar mansion in Vancouver. I took that, that's real, that's real. <laughs> so uh, I could go on at length about the planning and testing tips that I have for you, but I'm just gonna try and keep it short. Um, so one of the key planning t um, tips we have is to think of ways that you can plan to keep your patient census slow at your site that you're going live at, uh, whether this involves um, diverting patients or not. And think of ways to compensate your physicians for their time in this planning and implementation process because their participation is so important and their time is so valuable. And make sure that you have extra staff to support um, having peer mentors on the floor after your go live. And then next, test, test, and test some more. Um, one of the important things to develop is a a uh, play and train environment that's realistic and has complex patient data within it, and then have end users do testing within that environment, allowing yourself to have time to make changes um, to uh, your product um, before it goes live. And then also within that, having um, participation by key areas like lab, pharmacy, diagnostics, and registration. And know that all of this planning and testing will have a nice end result for your um, end users. So I'm just gonna call out a few uh, groups in the room to have things for you to think about personally. Um, so administrators in the room, do you have enough staff right now to support a peer mentor ratio of one to 10 after your go live for several weeks? And do you have the capacity to reduce your clinic volume by a significant amount for a couple of months after you go live? Uh, leaders, so this includes managers and educators. If you're somebody who supports staff documentation and education, do you know how this is going to change once you go live with a fully functional EHR? And do you know how to use this new tool to meet your accreditation standards and your patient care quality standards? And frontline staff in the audience, think about how your work, what your workflow is and um, how you interact with patients, and do you know how this is going to change? Um, one of the key things I'd like you to remember is that an EHR doesn't um, encompass all parts of patient care. Where does the EHR end and something else begin? Whether it's a phone call between colleagues or face-to-face -face communication, and most importantly, critical thinking. And just quickly, some things, if you know that you're having um, a rollout soon in your health authority, just a few things to ask your project team and. I'm more than willing to answer more questions about this after our presentation. And finally, one of the key issues that we found with the Island Health experience is that the Island Health EHR and Promise are not on speaking terms. So you, <laughs> so you need to think about this as a major issue in terms of the potential for duplicate documentation. So I'd like to just introduce Dr. Rachel Carson to talk about her own personal experience and learnings with the EHR. Thanks, Amy. So I have to start by saying that our uh, Island Health Renal team has done absolutely amazing work um, to, to make this transition happen. And I have to call out Amy, who has really been a rock star and who many times has been on the re receiving end of, of some really challenging phone calls and emails. And I, I have to say you've done a, an amazing job because we couldn't do this without our team. Um, so I'm here just to give you a sense of what uh, the Nanaimo experience was and what our timeline was and just to encourage you to find out more about the plans for electronic health record changes in your own health authority and those from Providence and Coastal and BC uh, Children's and Women's should actually pay particular attention because your Clinical Systems Transformation Project or CST is basically a grown-up version of the Island Health iHealth project. It's the same vendor, it's the same system. 
Um, and I believe the go live is sometime initially next year. So I wasn't really sure how to summarize uh, the impact and the scale of this change. So I actually thought I would just do a quick snapshot uh, for you of my experience of reporting some issues as we went forward as a single user of the system. And so I was the on-service nephrologist for our go live in March 2016. Um, and I come on service about every five weeks for the hospital. So in week one, we really noticed that hemodialysis associated med and lab orders were very difficult for the system to handle. Um, so as Amy showed, our patients are highly complex. They go to multiple areas in the hospital and in the community, and they're heavy users of unpredictably scheduled services. So I think everybody thinks we are special, and we are special <laughs> because the computer has a hard time accommodating orders for a dialysis run that's supposed to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but oh, they need an extra run on Tuesday night, and then you had to change the antibiotics because they actually needed ultrafiltration again on the next morning. The computer does not deal well with that kind of variability. Um, so in week, this was week one, and we'd been meeting for a long time prior to our go live. Um, by week five, we were still having a lot of issues with medication and lab orders, and I can't resist mentioning I did have to click 42 times to discharge a patient on Replivite with an interaction alert, and then that, thank God, has been fixed. <laughs> Um, so weeks 11 and week 17 and week 22, they were all a lot of the same issues. And so we've just passed the, the six month mark and we're still having ongoing challenges. And in talking with London Health Sciences Centre who also used the same vendor and went live about two, two and a half years ago in their hemodialysis units and their hospitals, they also continue to have significant issues at two and a half years. So speaking to doctors in the audience in particular, I can't emphasize enough the importance of workflow mapping ahead of your go live um, and engagement and support. Um, I also had some questions to that for different people in the room to be thinking about like Amy. So from a nephrologist perspective, are you engaged and does your workflow has it been mapped? And then also for the nephrologist groups, do you have enough nephrologists to actually work at half speed for a period of time? Can you book your clinics at 50% and still actually get the critical work done? Do you have locum relief arranged? Because it, it's, this is an enormous transition and, and self-care is really important. Um, and have you told the program directors of the teaching programs that you participate in that you may actually be unable to teach uh, effectively for several months and we actually unfortunately for our family medicine program in Nanaimo they took a real hit in terms of their resident experience with this go live for physicians and leaders and especially the quality councils and the, the medical directors of the hemo units um, it's important to know what your error reporting systems are and what system your IMIT go live group is going to use and whether they're the same or different um, and what your current pre-go live rates of error and safety events are so that you can so that you can know what the effects of the changes are and you can alert your team to potential risks. So those are important questions and, uh, and we're happy to be in touch with people after. Thank you. Go have coffee. Thank you.